Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Imaging Suit. Uh, we have a very special guest tonight, uh, Dr. Eleanor Gates, PhD, from the Lick Observatory in the University of California. And um, we're very pleased to have her and uh, cut it short. Thank you for coming. All right. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I think this is the third time I've actually been here to Hoagie Park to yeah. give a talk. Um, so many years separated between the two. Um, but I'm going to tell you tonight about adaptive optics, a technology that we help design at Lick Observatory and use and is now used at observatories around the world, how it works and what we've been doing the, the latest from Lick Observatory in this field. Um, so Lick Observatory, you've probably all seen it. You've probably all actually been there, east of San Jose on top of Mount Hamilton. It is the highest peak in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, which is what makes it such a wonderful place to have telescopes. And we have nine telescopes on the site in their own housings, uh, domes, um, of which I will just be talking about um, the one here in the foreground, the Shane three meter telescope. Uh, most of the telescopes are still used for research. Some are only used for public outreach, and some are completely retired um, on the mountain. But the Shane 3 meter is our largest telescope and the one which has adaptive optics on it. And here's a nice close-up image. And this has our old adaptive optic system on the bottom. It's been replaced by a new system, um, but it used to be this large black thing at the bottom of the telescope. Um, I'll show you a modern picture to see our new system is somewhat smaller. Um, anyway, the problem with imaging from a ground-based telescope is that there's turbulence in the atmosphere. And my friend Rem Stone, who used to be the mountain superintendent, said observing stars through the Earth's atmosphere is like bird watching from the bottom of a swimming pool. Not a very good choice, but unfortunately, we need air to breathe. This is where we are, so we have to look through the Earth's atmosphere. Um, but it does distort our view of the stars. And so, well, you can see in my little picture here, this bird, you can see through the surface, yeah, it's a bird, but you lose some of the details. Uh, many of you might be hard pressed to figure out what type of bird it is and its details. Um, same happens when we look through the atmosphere and sky. Um, so why do the stars twinkle? Um, Robert Hooke suggested that stars twinkle because there are small moving regions in the atmosphere having different refracting powers, which act like lenses, back in the 1600s. And he was a very, very smart man. He was right. That is how the atmosphere behaves. And when light passes through those different lenses, it gets bent and distorted. Um, Isaac Newton also wrote that the air through which we look is in perpetual tremor. The only remedy is a most serene and quiet air, as such as may perhaps be found on tops of the highest mountains above the grosser clouds. He was also a very smart fellow. Um, Lick Observatory was the first year-round accessible mountaintop observatory in the world because astronomers by the late 1800s had learned that, yes, your seeing is better when you're looking through less atmosphere and above most of the clouds. And today, all modern telescopes tend to be sitting on tops of mountains um, for, for the best possible views of the sky. Now, in 1953, an astronomer named Horace Babcock actually said, you know, we could correct for this using an optical element, a deformable optical element, to essentially put equal but opposite turbulence on the light we see, and a wavefront sensor, a, a way of detecting the blurring that the atmosphere is doing so we know what signal to send this optical element. Now, it wasn't until about 20 years ago that the technologies had been developed and the computers developed that actually made it possible to implement this. So he was fortunate. He died a few years ago, but he was fortunate to see his idea actually applied and used in astronomy. So where does the turbulence arise? Well, then here we have our little observatory on top of a mountaintop. And one of the sources of turbulence, heat inside the dome. And this is the only one of these sources of turbulence that we can actually control. So, you know, you have big telescopes, they have big motors to move them, you have instruments, you have, uh, you know, moving parts, motors to move things around, generates heat. So, most modern telescopes use air conditioning and things like that so that they can, um, you know, control the temperature and have all the materials inside the telescope dome and the telescope itself at the same temperature as the nighttime air, so that there's no heat waves and no what we call dome seeing. That we control. Unfortunately, the other things that cause turbulence, we don't have much control over. Um, wind flow over the dome. 
Most of the best observatories in the world, the best sites, tend to be on top of very high mountains. Think of Mauna Kea in Hawaii and uh, the Andes Mountains in Chile, but they also tend to be near large bodies of water so that the wind is a nice laminar flow over the water, over the top of the mountain. Um, so there are a few places where, in the world where geography works to our advantage to minimize the wind flow over the dome and that turbulence. So proper sighting of your telescope is very important. Um, Lick Observatory is not bad, but we're kind of low altitude at only uh, 4,200 feet elevation. Uh, and, uh, you know, but we are still, you know, the, the nice laminar flow of the, over the Pacific, over the California mountains, which is why you have multiple great observatories in California, Lick Observatory, Palomar Observatory, and Mount Wilson. So again, geography working in our favor, though not as good as, say, Chile or Hawaii. Uh, there's unfortunately this boundary layer where the, the sort of warm ground and the air interacting with the ground structures you know, hits the higher levels of the air, moving at different speeds or faster. Um, many of you felt the top of this boundary layer. It's about a kilometer up when you're, say, coming into land at the airport. When you get kind of close to the ground, you have some turbulence. That's usually the top of the boundary layer you're feeling. Um, and then, of course, there are different layers in our atmosphere where their air is going different directions. Um, so, for example, the Copepause, their stratosphere, about 10 kilometers up, uh, also a great source of turbulence. There's also the jet stream and other things. Um, we don't have much control over that. We just have to correct for it as best we can with adaptive optics. So, how do we get around the problems of the atmosphere? Well, we could put telescopes in space. We've all seen the Hubble Space Telescope images. They're gorgeous. They're not looking through the atmosphere. Don't have to worry about that blurring. They did have to worry about a misconfigured mirror initially, and <laughs> that was rather embarrassing for the uh, engineers who designed the telescope. But luckily, Sandy Faber at uh, Lick Observatory and some other prominent astronomers helped figure out what that aberration was to correct it with some corrective optics later on and gave the Hubble um, glasses. But at, you know, telescopes in space are great. The problem is they tend to be small. Um, and very expensive, and they're very limited. There are lots and lots of astronomers, as always. There are more astronomers than telescopes. Uh, so it's very competitive to get time on those space telescopes. So it's not the answer. Um, there's also a technique called speckle imaging, where if you take very short exposures, all the different little lens-like parts of the atmosphere focus the spot of what you're looking at in different places. So if you take very short exposures on the order of a few milliseconds, you get these little multiple images that you can sort of com use a computer and stack them all on top of each other and get a high resolution image. It only works for really, really bright objects because you've got to get enough light in a few milliseconds for this to work. Um, but it works very well, uh, but computationally intensive. And then there's adaptive optics, where we correct for the turbulence using hardware. We use what's called a wavefront sensor to measure the blurring, and then that figures out what the blurring is. We put sort of opposite turbulence on the deformable mirror. And this met, happens on the order of 1,000 times a second. The new systems we have built work 1,500 to 2,000 times a second to do corrections. So as computers have gotten faster, we've been able to do corrections faster. Um, the problem is with adaptive optics. You need to have a reference star nearby, because you need something that's a known point source that's sort of featureless to make the measurements. And so that, because you know without turbulence exactly what that point source looks like. With turbulence, you see how it blurs. It's blurred on the order of a thousand times a second and correct it. So, very complicated technique. Um, so, just for comparison, space versus ground based telescopes, we have the Hubble Space Telescope. Its mirror diameter is, is 2.4 meters. So, our Shane telescope is bigger, it's got a 3 meter diameter. So, um, for example, Resolution at 2.2 microns, which is a, a near-infrared wavelength. Um, our eyes don't see that light. Um, but you can see structures of the Hubble Space Telescope at that wavelength down to 0.23 arc seconds. And if you don't have a good intuitive sense of how big an arc second is, take a dime. Pretend I'm holding a dime. Have your friend walk two miles away. The width of that dime <laughs> from about two miles away is about one arc second. So we can see something that's roughly a quarter of an arc second in size with the Hubble Space Telescope from two miles away, and that's the, that's the smallest structure too, you can see. Now, the Shane telescope with a bigger mirror, the laws of diffractive optics, and uh, I'll show you an equation later that uh, you don't have to remember, um, we can actually do better. We can see something that's 0.18 arc seconds, or you know, just about a fifth of an arc second. Um, so, wow, that was interesting. 
<laughs> I have no idea yeah. what that was about. The director took a, a little, took a little a recess. vacation. <laughs> um, anyway, so, so you can see that the advantage of using adaptive optics on a telescope is that you could actually theoretically see smaller structures than you could with the Hubble Space Telescope. And of course, it gets better when you get a bigger telescope, say the Keck 10 meter telescope, you can see structures that are roughly three times smaller than with the three meter telescope. So that the, this, this scales up. You do even better with bigger telescopes using this technology. And uh, it just makes all the space telescope resolution look not so good. So in practice, you know, this is, this is the three meter mirror, is our adaptive optic system sits there on the bottom. So the light goes, oh, I should use the laser pointer for this. So the light comes down the telescope, hits the primary mirror, goes up to the secondary, through a hole in the primary to the instrument here at the bottom. And this has, um, you know, deformable mirrors to change the shape, to correct the turbulence, um, wavefront sensor, that blue thing is our infrared camera. Um, so, so that's what it actually looks like. So I keep using this term wavefront, I should probably describe a little better what it is. Um, so here, you have all the incoming starlight coming in, and all the rays coming from the star. The star is sufficiently far away that all the rays are essentially parallel. So if you look at all the light that came out of the star at the same time, all hits the top of our atmosphere at the same time, in this plane wave, as we call it. That's this line here. And then you have the turbulent atmosphere, all these little pockets of different temperature air um, you know, acting like lenses and distorts it so the rays start going in different directions. If we look at where the rays, the, the light points are going, you end up with this distorted wavefront. Now, if you have a small telescope, the, the overall tilt is sort of the dominant factor compared to what your resolution is. So that when you image, you can get a large displacement. The, the star appears to move around a lot. So if you have a small telescope, you might not need full adaptive optics. You might only need just image stabilization, a little fast-moving tip-tilt mirror to make sure your object stays centered. When you get to a bigger telescope, the overall tilt caused by a distorted wavefront tends to sort of average out over a long, large telescope. So you get small angular displacement when you image, but the blurring tends to be more high-order aberrations. All these little bumps and wiggles actually have a pr predominant effect. So you need the full adaptive optics to correct all those little bumps and wiggles better to get the full resolution out of your telescope. I hope I'm making sense. <laughs> I feel like I'm not necessarily explaining this very well. Anyway, but a schematic of how the adaptive optic system actually works is you have this distorted wavefront coming in from the telescope, and then you have your adaptive mirror here. You put sort of equal but opposite, or actually half the turbulence because it bounces off. Um, on your default mirror, you, make, you send the corrected light to your high resolution camera, uh, usually an infrared camera and adaptive optics, so we're improving the technology so it does work at visible wavelengths. And then you have your wavefront sensor, which is the gizmo that measures the distorted wavefront. And that use, goes to a computer, calculates what shape the DM needs to be, and this loop runs on the order of 1,500 times a second, maybe faster, maybe slower, depending on the system. So here's a little movie. Hope this runs. No, it did not run. Let's try again. There we go. So this is a nice animation. It's a rather old anima animation made by the Gemini telescope. Um, but you can see the light coming in the telescope, coming around to the back end. They have a nice system where you have multiple instruments on the telescope at any given time. So you just pick which one you want to use. We're going to pick the AO system here and get a little cutaway view. Um, my colleagues and I. Uh, do call this the potato chip movie. You will see why in a moment. Uh, but uh, this will cut away and see. You'll see the light comes in for the telescope. We'll come in, hit the deformable mirror, hit a beam splitter so that red or light goes to your science camera here, and you'll see an image pop up on the screen right here. And then the bluer light goes to the wavefront sensor. So you can see a nice blurry image coming through, bouncing around every few milliseconds. As times change. So here you're going to see in a moment the uh, distorted wavefronts or potato chips fly through the system, mm -hmm. bounce off the mirror. Now the mirror isn't doing anything right here. You can see the loop is open. But now the wavefront sensor is going to measure something. It's going to close the control loop. And now they're going to change the shape of the mirror. Now this is hugely exaggerated so that you can see what's going on. When you look at a deformable mirror when it's moving, it looks flat to our eyes. But you can see that the potato chips bounce off the deformable mirror. They get flattened out. They're nice tortillas now. 
flat tortilla is going to the side camera, and you can see that the light, once it gets to the side camera, nice closed loop, you have a nice point-like image, like a star should look, including a little airy ring around it. So I hope that gives you an intuitive idea of what's going on. So this is the original adaptive optic system at Lick Observatory that I was hired back in 1998 to redesign. When I first got there, it looked very different from this, but I worked with their optical engineer, um, Brian Bauman, to redesign it, to make it into something that one person, namely me, could um, align and maintain. Uh, so this went into sort of regular use in the year 2000, but the light comes down from the telescope, bounces off some optic, um, this thing here in the middle is a tip tilt mirror. It's just a flat mirror, image stabilization, just make sure that the spot stays centered. Um, if you buy a device called like the AO7 from Santa Barbara Instrument Group, it's a tip tilt mirror. It just stabilizes the image. Um, and so that was the first stage. Then the light's collimated, goes here to a deformable mirror. So our deformable mirror was six inches in diameter, had 127 actuators um, to correct the wavefront, and then the light was refocused. Infrared light bounced off into our infrared camera over here. The optical light bounced off a number of more optics into our wavefront sensor here. And I'm not going to describe how the wavefront sensor works, because I don't have time with everything else I want to tell you. But uh, if you're interested after the talk, I will give you some more details. Um, anyway, the standard deformable mirror back in the day when we started doing this was essentially a piece of thin glass with a bunch of little pistons behind it. You, most of these were uh, piezoelectric crystals glued to the back of the glass. Thin glass is actually flexible. And so our deformable mirror in our original AO system could um, change shape plus or minus 8 microns. So 16 microns total motion, um, which is quite a lot. And uh, it had a reflective coating, um, aluminum. Our new system uses a silver coating on one of its deformable mirrors. Anyway, this is pretty standard, what was used. But with only 127 actuaries, we were only actively controlling 60 of them in the center. And the ones around the edges in the center were sort of passively controlled to make sure they didn't wander off too far. But, uh, you know, so we weren't actually using every single actuator in the old system. Anyway, but when you have a perfect system, you know, say you're in space, you know, you, you don't worry about the equation. Um, the typical pattern you get if everything's perfect is what's called a diffraction pattern or airy pattern, where the center looked as, as a round disk where most of the light is, and then you end up with little rings, and this is sort of like a slice through it, around it, airy rings. Um, every 1.22 lambda over d, lambda is the wavefront you're looking at, d is the diameter of your telescope. So it's a very simple equation. It tells you how far out the first airy ring is. So and that tells you what the resolution of your system is, that you could essentially see stuff that's separated by that as two separate objects in that distance. Um, but that's perfect. Now, when you use an adaptive optic system, you never quite get to perfect, unfortunately, because you don't have an, an infinite number of actuators to control. Your measurements aren't 100% perfect. The atmosphere is a permissious thing. Different things are going on at different altitudes, so it's really impossible to measure things completely accurately. So in practice, you end up with this nice diffraction-limited core, which is great, and then this kind of uncorrected halo that's the same size as your seeing disk if you weren't using adaptive optics. So that seeing disk, you can see, is way broader um, than the central core. So we have a terminology in adaptive optics called STREL. That is the peak that you actually measure versus the peak if everything was perfect, like in the previous um, slide. Um, so if you get a STREL above 0.1 or 0.2, which means you're 20% of the way to perfectly corrected, you have nice, airy um, cores like that that you can make great measurements over, which is Great, and that's relatively easily correct, uh, achievable with um, relatively primitive adaptive optic systems. Um, so, so this just tells you what, if you have more actuators on your DM, how much you get. So if you have um, no adaptive optics, that's the dotted line. So that's an uncorrected seeing disk. So that's not very good. If you have just a tip tilt mirror, two degrees of freedom, that actually gives you close to an airy core and you know, gets rid of some of the halo. 12 degrees of freedom anyway, you get up to 218 actuators, degrees of freedom. You get first airy ring, second airy ring, third airy ring, fourth airy ring. That's really pretty darn good. 
<laughs> now, our system with the old Lick system was here around 50 degrees of freedom, which meant we got a real nice first area ring and hints of the next ones. Um, but that was an old system that was redesigned in the year 2000 and was used for over a decade. We've built a next generation adaptive optic system called ShadeAO as opposed to LickAO. Um, and this is a schematic of it, but one of the big improvements is we actually use two deformable mirrors, not just one. So, but wait, there's more. Um, <laughs> so the, it's a woofer tweeter system, much like you have a sound system. The woofer is actually a small deformable mirror with only 52 actuators. Um, in fact, I think the next picture is so here with a nice silver coating. Um, so it's comparable to the old deformable mirror in the original LickAO system. Um, so it can do all the same corrections that one did. And this one also does tilt correction as well. So it's got a lot of motion. Um, instead of using piezoelectric actuators on its back, it uses voice coil technology. And this thing is not six inches in diameter, it's one inch in diameter. So we've you know, reduced the size of the thing. Things have gotten more compact as technology has advanced. And then our tweeter is a 32 by 32 MEMS device with a gold coating. So this is a microelectromechanical device that is uh, with 32 by 32 actuators. That's a lot of degrees of freedom. That's like a thousand actuators. So we can make amazing corrections with this um, if we measure the wavefront well enough. That's the other complication. But anyway, you, we use these two. The tweeter is really great for the high frequency changes that are subtle, but changing frequently. Um, and, and that's most of what we see with the AO system. Um, anyway, so our new system, somewhat more compact. We're using the same housing for infrared camera, though we have a new detector in it as well that has many more pixels and much smaller pixels, so we get much uh, higher resolution with the camera. But anyway, the light comes with the telescope, bounces around a bunch of optics, comes to a woofer up here, the woofer DM. Down here is the tweeter. And we also have our wavefront sensor there. And our science camera, as I said, we have a new detector in there. Um, anyway, much more compact than our original system. So this, the camera here is the same size. The housing is the same size. But if you look at the, let's go back a number of slides. Whoops, went too far. There we go. But you can see it's, it's, it's shrunk one size by about half, <laughs> so, um, which is a huge improvement. Sorry. Is the, is the um, wavefront sensor upstream or downstream of the deformable mirror? It is downstream. Really? It is downstream. So it actually, when you turn on the deformable mirror, it's actually measuring more the errors in the previous correction cycle uh, okay. rather than right. the whole wavefront. So we're actually working on some new algorithms in which we do predictive control, where if we know the wind speed, we assume that the turbulence is a frozen flow over the telescope. So if we know the wind speed and direction, we could actually calculate, we have this turbulence here, oh, in this many milliseconds it'll be there, and we can actually predict, and, and so that's one of the things we have a graduate student working on right now. Um, anyway, but as I said, we have lots and lots of actuators, so our DM, with lots of degrees of freedom, is capable of correcting um, and turbulence incredibly well, but only if we can measure it well. So here is, is a little bit about how our, our wavefront sensing works. We've sort of mapped our um, primary mirror, that's this pink circle here, um, to an array. Um, so each one of the little dots, blue dots, are actuators on the MEMS device. And then we have a 16 by 16 across grid on which we met, with which we measure the wavefront. And uh, as I said, I'm not going to go into details of how we measure it, but uh, our old AO system only had an 8 by 8 grid, which meant that we, we only measured in eight different points across the, the deformal mirror, where here we measure 16. So we actually have twice the resolution with measuring the wavefront with our new AO system, which means that we can actually correct into the optical with this new system. The old system was optimized for the near infrared. So you may not realize that the turbines in the Earth's atmosphere affects different colors of light differently. When you have really long wavelength light, like radio waves, atmospheric turbulence is nothing. It just goes right through. It doesn't see it. So objects like the very large array for doing interferometry don't need adaptive optics. <laughs> so, but as wavelengths get shorter, they get affected more and more by the Earth's atmosphere. So by the infrared, 
it's affected, but not as severely as, say, blue light, which really needs very fast correction, lots of sampling across the primary mirror to make the measurements to see how the light is being bent at different places um, across the mirror. So um, one of the advantages of this is it's just sampling more. And we actually have plans to install, we've actually installed it, we haven't tested it yet, is to have another set of uh, wavefront sensor that has 30 apertures across, uh, so that we're measuring in nearly a thousand places across the deformal mirror, or across the primary mirror, on what the turbulence is doing, so that we can measure it better, we can correct it better. We have a deformal mirror that can handle this now. Computer is still having a little trouble with it, um, and our optical alignment still needs a little work. As I said, this is very new stuff. Um, but our new detector in our science camera um, is what's called a Hawaii 2RG array. They're commonly used now, um, and they're sensitive to light from you know, R band, red wavelengths, down through the near infrared. So from you know, around 7,000 angstroms down to 2.5 micron. W um, wavelengths. So we haven't worked yet in R and I bands with this camera yet with our new AO system, but it's coming. So which is pretty exciting. So so we're going to do optical astronomy finally with adaptive optics, um, and hopefully in a routine way. So this is our new detector. Um, we actually managed to get an engineering quality array, which means a quarter of it doesn't work, but we didn't need that bit anyway. So. The, the old detector in our infrared camera was a picnic array, 256 by 256 pixels. This is a 2K by 2K device, of which we're only actually using the 600 pixels that fill the same area as the old array. <laughs> so, and we're hoping to install some um, new grisms and stuff that can disperse light further and take advantage of the wider detector. Um, that works, we're just not using it right now. Um, but these are smaller pixels. We now have 600 pixels covering something that used to be only 256 pixels across. So if they're smaller pixels, we get higher resolution, particularly at J-band. Our diffraction li limit is less than 0.1 arc seconds. So um, you know, we have uh, 33 milli arc seconds per pixel. I've actually remeasured it. It's not 34 milli arc seconds. We're better than that. It's 33 milli arc seconds. So um, anyway, all sorts of new developments. So what does this mean in terms of actual data and what images actually look like now that I've you know, gone over the hardware? Well, this is an image from our original adaptive optic system showing two stars, one of which is a single star, new Ursa Majoris, and then a second star, Hipparchus 59366. Now with a single exposure with no adaptive optics at all, you'd be hard pressed to say which one was a single star and which one was a double star. You might have a guess, but it's hard to tell. With just tip tilt correction, you can see that that one's probably a single star and that one's most likely two. And then with a full adaptive optic, you see, oh, very clearly, single star, there's actually a first airy ring, though it's not showing up very well on this display, and two stars. And these two actually, you can see, are moving with respect to each other if you look at them after epoch after epoch. Um, so you can actually see changes and make real measurements pretty easily. Anyway, when you put the same technology and Lick Observatory, once we proved adaptive optics worked for routine science at Lick Observatory, we built a system for the Keck telescope in Hawaii, 10 meters in diameter, largest optical telescopes in the world right now, um, where without adaptive optics, you have this you know, indistinct blob with a still less than an arc second, less than half an arc second. This was a very good seeing night on Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea's typical seeing is about a half arc second. Um, whereas Lick Observatory, our typical seeing is about one arc second. We're a lot lower altitude, not too surprising. Um, but you turn on adaptive optics, and the resolution increases by about a factor of 10. And you have this right spiky thing that's easy to measure. Most of the light is squeezed into the core where it belongs. And you can see there, first area ring. Anyway, so this is great. So let's look at some actual real data rather than just single stars. Like Uranus, beautiful object. This was observed in 2003 with our original adaptive optic system at Lick, and you can see here on Uranus some cloud bands, a storm, a couple of its moons. One of the nice things about Uranus is it has a ring. Whoops, wrong button. Try that one. There we go. So if I change the contrast, you can actually see the ring. So, and you know, another one of its moons actually shows up. Now, so this is pretty cool. You know, who knew Uranus had a ring? Um, but with our new adaptive optic system, we do so much better. Here's Uranus again. You can now see individual storms 
and the ring shows up. That's what I think, three of its moons, nice airy rings. And so this was very early data. We put the system on the telescope in April of 2014. It wasn't really ready. <laughs> so it took us a couple months to get everything working, but this image of Uranus is really nice. Of course, if you go to someplace like Keck, you do even better. So Keck, here's the ring we were seeing at Lick, but, Keck actually, uh, but Uranus actually has a ring that's further out. And Keck Observatory can see it. It was actually discovered with the Hubble Space Telescope, but with Keck's adaptive optic system, you could see it. So, and the technologies that we tested with our new AO system at Lick Observatory are going to be part of the next generation adaptive optic system that will be built for the Keck telescope, at least if all goes as planned. Uh, but anyway, and I just have to show this picture because it's beautiful. Imke de Potter at uh, UC Berkeley uses Keck to study solar system objects, and this is a beautiful image of Jupiter that was put together with data through their adaptive optics system. So this is looking at um, 1.29, 1.58, and 1.65 microns. Um, so the, the goldish color is sort of the tops of clouds, um, and then the blue is haze. Anyway, if you look at longer wavelength of 5 micron, you can see that the, the great storm here, the great red spot, is, is actually cool enough. The cloud tops are cool enough it blocks the 5 micron light. Um, anyway, so it's, it's lots of science to be seen there. So this is the power of adaptive optics. You don't need to go to space. You don't need to send a space probe right out to Jupiter to get truly amazing images where you can actually monitor how things are changing on the planet's surface over time. Um, some other research I've worked on with Lick Observatory's original adaptive optics system was this um, with Marshall Perrin and James Graham uh, looking at Herbig AEBE stars. Herbig AEBE stars are young stellar systems still forming. They still have a lot of dust around them. Um, often they have protoplanetary disks around them. So we were studying these, a uh, few of these Herbig AEB stars to see is the dust here associated with both these stars, only one of these stars? You could do this using polarimetry. So our infrared camera is also a polarimeter. It can look at the polarized light coming from things. And when light bounces off dust, it gets polarized, sort of the same way when light bounces off asphalt, it gets polarized, and why your polarized sunglasses work so well to block the light. Um, anyway, so here's just what the image looks like you know, without you know, any polarization mapping. But if we look at the polarization, we could see the star here. All these little lines are showing the direction of the polarization. And if you had a complete <coughs> ring, that would say, OK, that's associated with that star there. That, it's, that, it, the, that star's light is illuminating the dust, and the light is getting reflected towards us. Um, same is true up here. So you can see sort of circles up here, circles up here. So yeah, the dust does seem to be one system, depending on which dust is closer to which star. You can see very naturally how it progresses. Um, we have a couple more of these. Again, here we can see the dust around the, the star. I actually particularly like this one because we were wondering, is this little dust tail associated with this star or is it associated with that little star? Well, you look at the polarization map, you can see how oh, clearly this, this is all associated with that. But this one, clearly, the way the polarization indicates that the light is coming from that star. So two separate systems just happen to be coincident in direction in the sky. Um, I don't actually know the distance to either of the stars, so I don't know if the distances are fairly the same or not. Um, I should someday figure that out. Uh, but anyway, we can also monitor this because there are protoplanetary disks, and that's blocking the light here. So why do you not see any light there? There's so much dust, the light is just blocked completely. And we've modeled that to come up with, uh, OK, so the direction of the disk is this, and relative thickness and such. Um, and that was all published in a science magazine article uh, many years ago now. Um, so this isn't exactly the freshest data. Um, but I've shown you all data so far taken in natural guide star mode, meaning that we're looking at a star that's close in direction or in the same direction as we're looking. So some of these objects, like the Herbig AEB stars, are pretty bright. They're young stars, they're bright, they're relatively close to us in the galaxy. So you can actually look at that science target and measure the turbulence using your science target directly. That's perfect. But my research usually involves faint little quasars. Not enough light coming from that for us to make measurements a thousand times a second. So we use a nearby bright star, a reference star, to actually measure the turbulence. But you can see, ideally, they'd be in the same direction, so you measure all the same turbulence. When it gets off axis like this, you're looking over here, the turbulence, the turbulence isn't the same there as it is there. 
So you're measuring the wrong turbulence. If it gets too far away, it's completely the wrong turbulence. You might actually make your image worse <laughs> instead of improving it because you're measuring the wrong stuff and correcting the wrong stuff. Um, so this is a problem because for a typical adaptive optic system to work, you need a star that's on the order of 12th magnitude. Now that's about 600 times fainter than your eye can see. So you might look up in the sky and say, oh, there are stars everywhere. Turns out that you really need a star that's within about 30 arc seconds of your target to have this technique work well. Within about 60 arc seconds or one arc minute of your target is sufficient, but it's not great. Um, my targets, I'm always unfortunate. My nearest guide star is like 45 arc seconds away from my science target, uh, <laughs> which is not ideal. Um, but it's the best you can do. But this is a problem because a lot of my quasars have no star within 60 arc seconds bright enough for this technique to work. Luckily, astronomers are clever. We can use a laser to put a, a reference star exactly where we need. We can point the laser right at the galaxy you're looking at. Great. The laser is yellow, um, as you can see in this picture here. Um, but we can plant it wherever we want it. And uh, how does this work? Well. Fortunately, about 90 kilometers or 60 miles above our heads is a layer in the mesosphere that um, is where meteors burn up. And when the, it's when the atmosphere gets dense enough that really the, the you know, disintegration of meteors happens in a hurry. And uh, that deposits all sorts of metals up there, things like potassium and nickel and sodium, and sodium is the one we care about. Um, you've probably seen around San Jose our sodium street lamps, the yellow ones. Unfortunately, they're replacing them with these LED lamps, which are not so good for astronomy. Uh, but back in the day, in the 80s, when San Jose started using the low-pressure sodium lamps, it was in cons you know, at, at the behest of Lick Observatory to control light pollution. And Lick Observatory named an asteroid San Jose after the city for doing such good things for um, helping keeping Lick Observatory competitive. Um, Take it back. Huh? Take it back. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. Um, but uh, anyway, so you've all seen that yellow color of those lamps. Our laser is exactly that color. Anyway, the light goes up, excites those sodium atoms. They de excite very quickly, re emitting the light, creating a star right where we want it, which is really pretty cool. Um, but there are some complications. Here's another beautiful picture of our laser coming out. Our laser is rather powerful. Um, it is like a big lightsaber coming out of the telescope. Um, it's about 12 inches in diameter, uh, 25 centimeters across, and it's 10 watts of laser power for running at high power. More typically, we only run between 3 and 5 watts, um, and that's partly because of the old technology we're trying to keep running until we get our new laser, which should happen in the next year, another new exciting thing in adaptive optics for Lick Observatory. But it is a powerful laser. It is not eye safe. You know, I'm sure we have blinded all sorts of insects over the years because um, they aren't smart enough to avoid the beam. Owls, bats, probably look at that and go, I don't know what it is, stay away from it. So I'm, I, you know, we probably aren't blinding wildlife uh, other than, than insects. Uh, but we could potentially blind pilots or something. So I have to work with the FAA um, to get permission to use our laser. Um, and in fact, I've been filling out paperwork like mad to renew our um, permission for the next couple of years to use our laser. Anyway, but the FAA requires safety measures to make sure we do not blind any pilots or air crews or do anything bad, because the last thing you want is coming into land at San Jose Airport and then suddenly have your pilot be blind. Very bad. Don't want that to happen. So we have plane spotters. So you might see this person here, one of our plane spotters. We have another one on the other side of the dome. We have two. They have headsets and radios so they can talk to our laser operator inside the dome, let them know if an airplane's coming. If an airplane is coming too quickly, that you know, trying to communicate is too difficult, won't be fast enough, they have a big red kill button with glowing red light. They can just push the button, shuts off the laser. So everything's safe. We also have a backup system mounted right next to the laser is a radar system. And the radar system will also detect any airplanes and within 100 milliseconds, shutter the laser and make sure the the airplane is safe. So um, it's pretty good for, for pretty much any airplane we're likely to see above Mount Hamilton, unless it's a uh, fighter jet going faster than Mach 9, uh, <laughs> which is unlikely. Huh? Is that being used pretty much every night? No, we only use the laser on the order of three to ten nights a month. Okay. Not all instruments, not all science requires the high resolution of adaptive optics, and it's <clears throat> expensive 
both in terms of people and actual dollars uh, of equipment to, to run it. Uh, so we try and use it when needed, of course, but it's, it's not feasible to do that every night. Unfortunately, most of the light from the laser actually goes right through the Earth's atmosphere into space. And it is sufficiently powerful laser and well collimated that it poses a hazard to astronauts and any downward looking satellite cameras. Uh, so <laughs> well, I have to work with uh, Space Battle Manager, and yes, that really is his job title at uh, Air Force Space Command to uh, tell them what we want to look at in advance. I submit a form and they s send us back information of when we need to shut down our laser if we're looking in that direction to make sure we don't eliminate anything we shouldn't in space. So um, it's a lot of paperwork going back and forth that I have to manage. Uh, but it's worth it because we have this cool laser. Um, here's the Rayleigh scatter. So that Rayleigh, that, that laser beam you see is actually not what we're interested in. And that goes up to about 35 kilometers altitude. Um, and then the atmosphere gets pretty sparse, so we don't see a lot of reflected light coming back, scattered back towards us. And then at 90 kilometers, we have our nice laser spot right where we need it. And here's a little short history of laser guide star adaptive optics. Um, back in the 1980s is when adaptive optics was first being implemented and designed as part of the military Star Wars Defense Initiative, or SDI. As far as I know, adaptive optics may be the only really useful thing that ever came out of that uh, large military program. Uh, there may be other things, but I'm not familiar with them. Um, anyway, in the year 1991, right as I was starting graduate school, they declassified a great deal of information, because essentially the astronomy community was starting to catch up. And that's when the military and the astronomy community really started um, collaborating and uh, sharing technologies and information. Um, and then in 92 to 94, Sodium laser guide star experiments started at Lawrence Livermore Labs. Uh, and then in 1994 was the first time they installed it at Lick. And 1994 was also the year I started working for the Air Force on some adaptive optics technologies, not particularly on laser technologies, but uh, related projects. And then it took a couple years to get our first image you know, with the adaptive optic system actually working with the laser. And then in 2002, after I helped redesign the, the adaptive optic system, we start having routine science done with the laser guide star at Lick Observatory. So it's now been you know, nearly 15 years that uh, we've been doing routine laser guide star science at Lick Observatory. Um, and we were the first observatory to do this in a routine way. We were not the first observatory to do laser guide star work. Um, but we were the first ones to make it routine and robust and really start spreading the technology to other observatories, such as Keck, um, which started doing regular um, routine science, there it is, in 2005. And then in, two, in the same year, Gemini North in Hawaii also got theirs running in 2007. Subaru Telescope in Hawaii did it. 2008, we added later to the second Keck Telescope. Um, and now Keck Next Generation AO is in the works. And of course, all the 30 meter and giant telescopes plan to have adaptive optics with lasers as well. So hugely useful technology that uh, really was, was uh, pushed through and made to work by Lick Observatory. So how well does the laser work with our new system? Well, here's a cute little planetary nebula called IC2003 in the constellation Perseus. Without adaptive optics, big fat blob. Some other background stars there. With adaptive optics, you know, see the planetary, no, sorry, the planetary nebula, the white dwarf at the center. And this is only 10 minutes exposure in each color. So it's very short exposure time. So uh, that's why it looks kind of noisy. But lovely image shows the power of this. When you use a laser guide star with a bigger telescope, such as Keck, um, you get great results. Um, unfortunately, I don't know the angular scale here, but these images are probably corrected to be you know, 0.04 arc seconds or something like that across. Uh, so with natural guide star AO, the natural guide star is off in some corner here. I've forgotten exactly where the, the natural guide star is. But since it's off axis, the correction is not so great. With the laser, because you point the laser right at the center of the field, all of a sudden you see a lot more detail in the stars. Now, our galaxy, like all large galaxies that we believe, have supermassive black holes at their cores. And with this, you know, the stars in the center of our galaxy should be orbiting around that black hole pretty quickly over a number of years. So Andrea Ghez, 
um, has been using the Keck telescopes. This is hard research to do from Lick Observatory because the galactic center is really very close to the horizon here. Uh, but at Keck, it's much higher up in the sky, so they use Keck, plus it's a bigger telescope. Anyway, they've actually measured between 1995 and 2014 the motions of many stars in the core of our, our galaxy, and they've actually successfully plotted these orbits, measured them, measured the mass of the central black hole in our galaxy, which is about 4 million times the mass of our sun. <clears throat> so in terms of supermassive black holes, it's actually kind of a smallish one at least compared to the ones I usually measure. Um, and let's see if I can get this movie going. This is just an animation that I think is absolutely beautiful of the data that Andrea Ghez has um, and her, her colleagues have come up with from Keck that just shows sort of a 3D model of all these stars they've actually measured. Now one second equals about two years in this animation and they've propagated backwards in time to go back to about 1893 uh, so that you can actually see some orbits of some of these further out stars. Um, but it's pretty amazing that we've been able to measure the motions of so many stars in the center of our galaxy, which just wouldn't be possible without adaptive optics to make these measurements as, as frequently for this long. And it's uh, pretty, pretty cool. Anyway, so I'm gonna talk now about some of my own research um, and I study quasars and their host galaxies, and I use our adaptive optics system to image them, to try and find out more about the host galaxies and the masses of the black holes at their centers. So a quasar, the term originates from back when they were first discovered, when it stands for quasi-stellar object. So quasars, when they were first discovered, looked like stars, but they didn't have the same colors as normal stars. They tended to be bluer. And so they called them quasi-stellar objects because they didn't really know what they were. Now we've discovered that they're galaxies, and at the center of the galaxy is a supermassive black hole with an accretion disk around it. And as things go into the accretion disk, as a spiral in towards the black hole, gets very hot, emits a lot of radiation. Some of the stuff gets close to the black hole, swings, sling, slingshots, excuse me, out into these jets. Um, anyway, they're very dynamic, very massive. But this area from the accretion disk in these jets can be brighter than the whole rest of the galaxy combined. And since they tend to be far away, you know, six, seven billion light years away, you're not seeing the faint galaxy. You're seeing just this central region. Um, so what I've done with our adaptive optics system is I've imaged, and it's usually a couple hours of time on each galaxy, and they're faint. <laughs> you know, I mean, these are not, they don't look like bright stars. Um, so, so some of these are NGS data, some of them are with the laser. Um, I don't necessarily discriminate between the two in most cases. Um, anyway, but this one is a redshift of 0.76, which puts it about on the order of, I don't know, six and a half to seven billion light years away. And, uh, but this is, this is the host galaxy you can see around there. So with adaptive optics, it's very faint, and I've smoothed this image to make it a little easier to see. I've subtracted out most of the point-like core from the quasar itself, so that we can see the rest of the galaxy and its, its central bulge. Um, we've discovered that a lot of these are interacting or have nearby companion galaxies. Um, so, so we've discovered a number of new galaxies in terms of this research. Uh, but there's a correlation between the size of the host galaxy and the central black hole mass that's been discovered. And so now that we can, we can um, we've detected the host galaxy, which is a feat in and of itself, we've gotten enough light from it that we can actually model it. Is it an elliptical galaxy or is it a spiral galaxy? Now, most of the ones we've discovered are elliptical galaxies, not so surprising. Um, and then we can make an estimate of black hole mass. So this one, we sort of have an upper limit of the black hole mass of 290 million times the mass of the sun. Now compared to our Milky Way galaxy, that has a supermassive black hole that's only four million times the mass of our sun. So we're talking much more massive black holes in these distant quasars. They're more active, they're younger galaxies, and we're trying to understand the evolution of this, and I'll get more into that in a bit. Um, anyway, here's another one again. I subtracted out the quasar core so you can see the, the main galaxy. It also has a couple companions over here. Um, it's a little further away. Um, Again, and it also has an upper limit on the mass of the black hole of 1.3 billion times the mass of our sun. That's a pretty big black hole. 
It's one of the biggest ones we've, we've uh, discovered thus far, at least that we've measured. Um, and here's another sample. This one's a much less exciting galaxy, but this one is one of the few that actually turns out to have a, a spiral galaxy profile rather than an elliptical galaxy. Um, it has also a foreground star there for comparison of what a star looks like versus the galaxy. Um, so anyway, we have a large sample of these. I'm not going to uh, excuse me, bore you with all that. But uh, Yi Pei Wei, a uh, Chinese student, was working with my collaborator Mark Lacey. Had a whole lot more of these. He analyzed, um, and uh, you know we've got pages of charts like this. But you're showing the original data. We subtract the PSF, that central black hole region that looks like a point source, to see the rest of the galaxy. Model the galaxy. Um, of that. But three of these galaxies have companions or interactions, the, this one, this one, and this one. Um, and uh, it also seems like those, at least two of them, um, if we do model fits to see is it an a elliptical galaxy or a spiral galaxy, two of the ones with interactions appear to be spiral galaxies. Uh, the third um, looks like it's probably elliptical, and all the rest seem to be ellipticals. So these active galaxies, quasars, do tend to be predominantly in spiral galaxies. Often they're in interacting systems, but not always. Um, so we're looking, starting to get enough of these measured so that we can start looking at statistics. Now we haven't actually finished that. Um, Yu Peng just finished this work in uh, 2014. So this is all in progress. So um, none of it's been published yet, though we're working on it. Um, anyway, to help figure out the evolution of uh, how these uh, quasars evolve in active galaxies, um, we're also expanding our sample, not looking at just more distant quasars, but some active galaxies. And active galaxies are a lot of different kinds. They all have the same core things going on, however. They all have the black hole, the accretion disk um, around it. Broadline region is stuff here around the black hole very close in that uh, is, you know, light from the accretion disk excites the, the gas, emits broad lines because it's moving pretty fast around the center. There are thinner clouds, gas clouds, that have narrow lines, as we call them, very, very narrow emission lines from oxygen and hydrogen. Um, and, uh, and then, but sometimes there's this big, dense torus of gas, so that if you're in, a, say, a type 2 Seifert galaxy, you can see narrow lines, but you see no broad lines. That's because this dense torus of dust is blocking your view, and the light just doesn't get there. Narrow, uh, see for one galaxy, you see both broad lines and narrow lines in the spectrum. And uh, so, so we think it's all mostly viewing that angle that determines whether something's a Seifert 1 or a Seifert 2 galaxy. Though we have seen curious things where some Seifert 1 galaxies have become Seifert 2s and vice versa, if you look at them over time. So not quite sure what's going on there with the dense regions of dust that may be blocking things. But um, when you have you know, lots of a very dusty galaxy, you know, you can also have what's called an obscured quasar, where the quasar is not the typical bluish color, but more red, because there's lots of dust absorbing light. Um, so there is, it can get very complicated. But one of the things is theorists say that, well, these supermassive black holes form at the center of galaxies through mergers of galaxies. Well, that's great, except when we look with Hubble Space Telescope, you see that actually, if you have a sample of galaxies like AGN host galaxies over here and any active galaxies over here, that you really don't see any difference in the statistics of which ones have active cores um, versus inactive galaxies, where you don't see any of these, these um, spectral lines and in interactions because the black hole isn't actively sucking anything in at the moment at the center of the black hole for these inactive galaxies. So what is going on? Well, some people are trying to merge these, these facts that we've measured you know, with the theorists say versus what our observations are. Say, well, maybe it's only the most massive black holes that have formed through these big mergers of galaxies. And maybe the less active, less luminous AGN, you know, they're, they're maybe just sucking in the occasional dwarf galaxy or something. It's much more minor interactions. Um, I don't know. It's, it's one of these things that we just don't know what, quite what the answer is. But... Um, my colleague, uh, Varda Bennert, um, also in the UC system, you know, has, has observed with very deep exposures with the Hubble Space Telescope, elliptical galaxies. And it turns out that in these elliptical galaxies, 
if you look long enough, and these are, you know, like 11,000 second long exposures of these elliptical galaxies to the Hubble, and they modeled the galaxy and subtracted that off so that you can all see there's interaction, you know, of, you know, you could see remains of tidal tails and stuff. In, in all these images. So if you look hard and long enough, you can actually see evidence of old mergers in these old elliptical galaxies. So that might explain some of the supermassive black holes that we see often in um, uh, elliptical galaxies. But there's a problem. If you look, you know, if there was star, you know, if two galaxies merge, there should be star formation. But you look at the youngest stars in the galaxy, and they tend to be on the order of 500 to uh, 500 to 1,000 million years old, whereas the activity of uh, AGN, we think it's on the order of 50 to 100 million years. So there's this time difference that doesn't match. So how do we resolve this problem? There's lots of contrary information. What's going on? Well, we think part of it is just that, whoops, is a selection effect that uh, we need to study the whole quasar population. We think we're missing some. And so there are gaps in our knowledge that don't, you know, so, so we don't know everything. So um, it turns out that the mid-infrared luminosity is a very good process, proxy for the total or bolometric magnitude or luminosity of an object. And uh, the WISE telescope, and here's a nice artist's rendition of it in the background image, um, looks at the mid-infrared wavelengths. So we've actually used the WISE data, correlated it with the uh, Sloan um, Digital Sky Survey to hopefully get some spectra to go with some of these uh, quasars. Anyway, but losing that to, to find really bright quasars that might be obscured by dust, but dust is pretty transparent in the mid-infrared so that we can see the, the quasar brightness even if the rest of the galaxy gets in the way and obscures it uh, with the dust. So this is the, how we, we came up with the project name of the Y Selected Low Redshift Obscured AGN. Kind of a long title, but very descriptive of what we're doing. Anyway, um, we found a bunch in our near, in the relatively near universe with redshifts between 0.2 and 0.5. Um, so, so there's a lot of... Uh, lot to deal with. And in fact, we came up with 69 objects that fit our criteria of likely obscured AGN uh, that were also bright enough to be considered quasars and not some of the lower energy AGN like Seifert galaxies. Uh, and then we discovered that eight of them, only eight, had suitable guide stars near them, natural guide stars that we could use for tip-tilt corrections. Because one of the problems with laser guide star that I glossed over, didn't mention at all, is that even though we put the laser anywhere we want, the tip tilt, the gross motion of the light getting bent through the atmosphere has to be measured with a natural star. Now that natural star could be pretty faint, down to 18th magnitude um, with our current system. Uh, and pretty much most objects in the sky have something that's 18th magnitude or brighter within an arc minute. Uh, but uh, only, only eight of them were in this redshift range with guide stars that were good enough for the AO system with our old AO system when we picked up the sample. Our new AO system, we probably have more, so we need to go look at our sample. But uh, so far, we've only observed four. So these are the four. So, um, and there are distances between about 3.7 to 4.6 billion light years away. So in terms of what I usually look like, they're pretty, look at, they're pretty close. <laughs> in terms of the rest of the universe, no, they're not really that close. Um, but three of them show faint hints of interaction. You can see that there may be a companion galaxy and tidal tail here. This one has another object and maybe a little tidal tail there. This one has a big honking tidal tail, that, but we don't see evidence of any other galaxies. So we want to reobserve these. This one looks very plain. It doesn't look like it has any other interactions going on at all. So either we need to observe longer, uh, but uh, anyway, but, but this is what's going on. So we're going to analyze these. We haven't yet made any estimates of um, the uh, mass of the central black holes on these yet. Um, right now we're still trying to um, get basic data and are they interacting or not and try and figure out how do these supermassive black holes form and is it really all mergers of galaxies or are there multiple processes going on that we have to fit into the models with the theorists. Um, anyway, due to the time I think I'll stop here uh, and just give you a taste of adaptive optics is really doing some great science. It's being used to telescopes all the world. And with advances in technology, we are really making 
advances in how well the systems work and how useful they are. Thank you. Thank you. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. It depends partly on what wavelength you want to detect light at. Um, certainly, we always want to go faster. There are days, particularly when the jet steam is going really fast over us, our system can't keep up. And so the individual conditions of any nights um, determine you know, that. But yeah, currently we would like to go faster. Usually the speed of your system is determined by how bright your guide star is because you need to measure, a, get a certain amount of light from your guide star, integrate for a certain amount of time so you can make a reliable measurement. Um, and so some guide stars, if you're using a 13th magnitude guide star, you're probably only running the system maybe at 100 hertz or 50 hertz, which is quite slow. When you have a zeroth magnitude guide star, you're looking at Vega, it can be done. Um, yeah, you can run at 1500 hertz, 2000 hertz, maybe even, you know, probably even faster. Um, so there are inherent limits like that. So adaptive optics is great technology. If we can get detectors that have no noise, that would be a huge improvement for adaptive optics, uh, as well as many other programs. Those detectors don't exist, but they're, they're getting lower noise all the time. Uh, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's mostly adaptive optics these days. It's not limited by computing power but by the brightness of the source you're measuring and the noise of the camera. So that your, your measurements of what the blurring is is the, the major um, limitation these days. How much light goes, for that beam splitter, how much light goes which way? Well, if the, if the beam splitter was perfect, which they never are, but if they were perfect, 100% of the infrared light would go to the science camera, and 100% of the optical light that we're using to measure the wavefronts would, would go to the wavefront sensor. Not quite perfect. Usually, you know, we lose a few percent at each optical interface, but it's it's pretty close. It's 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 very so good. You have to change the beam as you move up the into the optical. Right? Yes, we change the beam splitter as we change light. So right now we have a beam splitter that splits at about 900 nanometers, um, 9,000 angstrom. So it's in infrared. So we're using light shorter than that to measure that. If we want to do work in the I band, in, you know, or down at, at uh, you know, 9,000 angstrom or 8,000 angstrom wavelength, we would have to put in a different beam splitter. And that's in our plans. We actually have a beam splitter slide that has poles ready for the new, you know, beam splitter so we can do optical work. We just haven't installed it yet. I don't not think, I'm not sure we've even ordered the new beam splitter yet. Uh, but it is coming. So, anything else? Available on Amazon. <laughs> I wish it were that easy. <laughs> yeah. So maybe I missed it, but when you're using your laser guide star, mm -hmm. um, do you see a lot of reflected light for the laser going up, or is it mostly just the emitted light after it's been absorbed by the sodium? Well, what we, what we see from the ground that causes this problem is the light scattered back towards us as it goes up because unfortunately the, the Rayleigh scattering is caused by molecules and dust and stuff in the atmosphere is very directional. If it goes up, it tends to reflect right back towards you. So luckily, because um, our laser is mounted on the side of our telescope um, rather than in the center, it goes up. There's a little bit of parallax, so the top of the Rayleigh scatter tends to be a little off axis from where our star actually is, and that actually helps us. Uh, Keck telescope is the same way. Um, some other telescopes have it mounted in the center of obscuration, so they hope that the secondary mirror itself will block that Rayleigh scattered light. Uh, so, but these, these are they possible to mount separately? Hmm? I'm sorry. Would it be possible to mount it separately? Yes, and that's been done. The Air Force certainly does that. They have a separate beam director telescope mounted separately. So these things, this, this really only works with relatively small field of view, like down to the 10, 20 arc seconds that you're talking about? Yes. You can work on more of that. <laughs> yeah, if you want to correct a larger field of view, yeah, there, are, there are techniques to do this. It's called multi-conjugate adaptive optics okay. and also a constellation of laser guide stars. So there's what's called cone anisoplanetism. <clears throat> you put your laser there, and because the light is a diverging beam, you only measure the turbulence you know, from 90 kilometers up in a, in a sort of cone, which means that there's turbulence up there that the starlight is going through that you're not measuring with a laser. You can fix this by having more lasers. 
and have a little constellation up there and have a, you know, combine all that information and do tomography, as it's called, to figure out, you know, what the turbulence is at each laser, uh, each layer of the atmosphere, have a different deformable mirror corresponding to each layer of the atmosphere. Now, they're doing this on some telescopes. That is not an experiment that we are doing here at Lick Observatory. But you can't get quite the big wide field high resolution you can get with the Hubble. Right, that is one of the advantages of the Hubble Space Telescope is wide field. It's still expensive. I mean, you know, either way you do it, ground-based astronomy is still cheaper than space telescopes, and you can have more of them, but it's still complicated, expensive technology and very computationally heavy. So. But you, you said earlier at, at dinner, and I think you said at the beginning of your talk too, that for amateur size <coughs> diameters, the mm -hmm. tip tilt is really all that we need. That's this really, tip tilt will do most of the correction. I mean, you know, if you had a more sophisticated system, you might eek a little bit more out of it. Mm -hmm. But small telescopes have a pretty broad airy disk. Their resolution, inherent, you know, resolution based on just the optics themselves is, is not so great. So a lot of that aberration ends up inside that airy disk and you don't really notice it so much. Um, yeah, could small telescopes, certainly on a bad seeing night, could benefit from more sophisticated adaptive optics, but the cost-benefit ratio is pretty small. You know, tip-tilt system is actually relatively easy to build. Um, well, it, it depends. I mean, the, the commercial ones out there run on the order of 40 or 50 hertz, more in what I call the active optics range. Active, active optics is sort of things running slower than about 100 hertz. And faster than 100 versus adaptive optics. Um, it's sort of an arbitrary cutoff, but uh, sort of reasonable. Yeah, I, I had one of my, one, uh, uh, it wasn't the, the SB one, it was a, a British one. Mm -hmm. But I could never get enough brightness to get short enough exposures to run at a decent frequency. That, that, that tends to be the problem. You couldn't use it to, you could only use it to correct positioning and certainly not the, any uh, atmospheric turbulence or anything. So yeah, that's, that's the problem is, is speed and the sensitivity of the detector and do you have a bright enough star nearby or is the object bright enough? It's the same problems we have with the, the bigger systems. Um, and it's, it's, we have exactly, it's, it, it, let me tell you, it's so frustrating when you have this, I have this, I have this sample, I have all these quasars I want to observe and they don't have any guide stars bright enough. As I said, our new system is more sensitive. It's got newer detectors, less noise, and it's, it's much more sophisticated. So I could probably expand my sample from what it was originally. Um, but it still won't ever get every object in the sky. A couple of years ago at a, a Golden State Star, <coughs> uh, there was a lecture by, uh, by a chap, and he was talking about something called, that he called computational optics, mm -hmm. um, in which there were, uh, he was predicting that there would be optical systems that used the, the, the light field sensors that could detect the, the wavefront angle, and you would sample those at a fairly high frequency and store them in a big buffer, and then computation, look at what was happening over time and figure out what the distortions were and what the wavefront was, and then correct for it computationally coming out of the back of this sampling system. Have you heard of anything like that? I, I, uh, people have discussed it. I, I won't say I'm very knowledgeable okay. on it. Um, you know, part of me, you know, it can be done, but is it any more effective That's than what, what we're doing in the first place? Because the problem is, is that still, since you're doing the corrections later, you spread the light out over a lot and there's all the noise of each pixel, whereas we're taking care of things so we get the high signal to noise where we need it, and then the rest is like, well, there's no light out there anywhere, so we don't care about the noise. So, so that, to me, seems the main argument currently for doing this in real-time correction with hardware rather than doing it computationally. So, not to say that it can't be done, but uh, that's my bias is obvious. <laughs> yeah? Good evening. Thank you for your talk tonight. Uh, could you possibly explain further an issue of workers and tweeters? Uh, is this like what's in a car? This is sort of. It's down the street. Yeah, yeah, so so essentially, in, you know, it's, it's it's analogous to what we use with sound with speakers. That the woofers are sort of the 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 bass notes, the the slower uh, frequency um, sound waves compared to you know, and we correct the uh, slowly changing aberrations with our woofer DM. Things that are more dominated by, say, flexure of the telescope itself as the telescope moves, that, that changes slowly um, is the woofer. And they also tend to be bigger aberrations so that the, the woofer DM has bigger stroke, that each actuator can move further uh, to correct things. Whereas the tweeter, each actuator can only move a tiny little bit. 
but there are many more of them, and they can move much faster because they're smaller, and the control loop is, is you know, it's just designed that way. So that that actually does, you know, does all the high frequency um, corrections, uh, and and uh, really is gives you the high fidelity, high contrast images, high resolution images that you want. So so our DM working, our our sorry, our woofer DM working all by itself is very comparable to the original adaptive optic system at Lick Observatory, but it's that MEMS device that you know it's just you know it's about an inch square. It's small. Um, silicon chip device um, with a thousand actuators really, really can clean up your image and make it look beautiful. Um, so that's, that's the, the tweeter aspect, the higher frequency corrections. So, so you use the, the woofer to correct not just the atmospheric tokens but also the and so forth? Yes. That's cool. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's just, it's, it's just, it's just the woofer, the woofer tweeter, is, is this, it's, it's just moving light. It's, it's, it's just, it's talking about the frequency of how frequently the corrections are, you know, that they change shape. So the woofer changes shape. Our woofer only goes at 200 hertz. It always goes at 200 hertz. We never change its speed. It's the tweeter that can go up to 1500 hertz. So it's a high frequency. And in, in speakers, woofers do the, the low frequency sound versus tweeters do the high frequency sound. Um, so there's no sound involved with these deformal mirrors. It's pur purely the, the frequency of which, which they're changing shape. That's analogous to the woofer tweeter speakers. Would it be an actuation movement or like a vibration? Uh, it's an actuation movement. It goes, stays. Next step, it stays. Chunk, 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 chunk. So they don't go back and they just stay. Yeah, pretty they much. They, they, yeah. Got it now. Okay. Yeah. Our, our, our wavefront sensor, our wavefront sensor is what's called the Shark Hatman, ha, Shack Hartman uh, wavefront sensor, which is a camera. It is a, is a high speed, low noise camera that can read out up to 2,000 times a second. Um, we only run it at 1.5 kilohertz because our computer can't quite keep up if we run it faster. So, you know, we've got a lot of hardware. It's like, oh, we're pushing our, our computer as, as hard as it can go to get that. Uh, so there's lots of movements that detect away from the different spots across the cell. That's, uh, yeah. Cell, a, a matrix of attention. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, we've got some, somewhere here. Uh, see, what I didn't have time to present was another cool instrument that uses a deformable mirror. Like, uh, let's see if I can find our Shaq Hartman. Uh, where'd it go? <laughs> Too many slides. <clears throat> where is it? There it is. So essentially the Shaq Hartman, whoops, let's display it so you can see it. <laughs> there we go. So, so this is like, uh, uh, so here we have our camera, and then we have a little set of lenslets in front of the camera. So we, we take the light from the telescope, the incoming light. If it's a plane wave, we, this essentially acts like many little telescopes arrayed along, around the, on the primary mirror. And we look at each little section, each little tiny telescope, and see where the spot lands on the camera. Uh, on our wavefront sensor. So if there's no aberrations, the spots are absolutely evenly spaced. It's all perfect. There's no corrections needed. Unfortunately, your aberrated wavelength, you know, hits this little lens, the spots offset. Here it's offset differently. You can actually work backwards and measure how each little spot is offset and computationally figure out what that wavefront shape was to put the spots where we measured them. So, and then you put that shape, well, half that shape opposite on your deformable mirror to correct the turbulence. Um, so it's sort of the, the, the quick explanation of how the wavefront sensor works. Um, so there are many different types of wavefront sensors. We happen to use Shaq Hartman. Um, there are phase diversity and curvature sensors and all sorts of other complicated kinds. But uh, this one's conceptually probably the easiest one to understand. How fast is that loop? That is correct. 
So as I said, we're pushing our computational power to do these, make these measurements and change the shape of the DM 1,500 times a second. I'm not sure, you know, so it's, it's very fast. You know, we're, we're trying to do things on microsecond scales <laughs> rather than millisecond scales. So, um, you know, that's, that's challenging. I mean, cable length starts being a problem because <laughs> it takes a certain time for the signal to go down the cable. Um, so, so that having a more compact system actually helps us because it's shorter cable length. And you know, every, every microsecond we can eke out of the system helps. <laughs> I don't recall seeing a, um, a design in which the, the deformable mirror was actually a, an alternative to secondary. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense as well? What's the best place to put that? Um, the advantages of adaptive secondary mirrors is great because adaptive optics adds a lot of optics into the system. And every time light hits an optical interface, you lose some light. So having an adaptive secondary is great because um, you, you, you're not having a bunch of other optics in the light path. However, they're big and they're expensive. And the bigger things are, the harder they are to move quickly. So that the adaptive secondaries tend to use voice coil technology, um, and that moves pretty quickly. But it's still it's a lot of mass, so so they don't tend to move quite as quickly. But you gain in overall light through the system. You don't lose as much light. So there are trade-offs. Both systems work well. Um, you know, it's just choosing what you do. I mean, we're not going to have we're not going to put an adaptive a secondary on the the Shane right. Telescope at Lick Observatory. It's just not in the plans. But the like the primary of of Keck, isn't it actuated in order to align all those cells? Yes, this is an active control system uh -huh. at Keck Observatory to align each of its hexagonal submirrors, and, and they've got these fancy edge sensors and everything to, to make sure it stays aligned and in the right shape no matter where they point the telescope, and that's always going. But that's um, not fast that's enough. That's not fast is. enough, yeah. no. That, that runs, I'm not sure how fast it runs. It's, it's, it's an active system, and so it's certainly less too, than 100 hertz. The cells would be too, big, too large as yeah. well, right? Okay. Yeah. That is correct. Yeah. Right. They, they use a local system for the edge sensing actuation that has nothing to do with what's going coming through the telescope. It's a completely separate subsystem at Keck. Yeah. Have you heard of or you might have seen the, uh, what is it, the trillion frame handling? And would that ever work towards what you're doing in your field? I am unfortunately not familiar with that device, so I don't know. Oh yeah, I think they used it to track an individual yeah, light pulse or something. I remember seeing that. Yeah, th that camera. I have no idea what its properties are. Certainly, very fast cameras that are very sensitive could definitely be useful for astronomy, particularly for wavefront sensing. I'm not sure how sensitive that camera is, what noise properties or anything else are. Um, so I can't. At this time, Judge, I'll have to look that all up if it's even available online. <laughs> Anything else? Well, thank you. The Shane Telescope, we do offer tours um, for a fee uh, to, to private groups that can go behind the scenes at the Shane Telescope, um, I believe. SJA did one of those last year, and they're thinking about maybe doing one again this year. Um, so, yeah, yeah. They're, they're not necessarily cheap tours, but... Uh, <laughs> anyway. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. I hope I didn't confuse too many people. It's a complicated talk, and I tried to squeeze a lot in there. <laughs>